Uh, it was just six years ago when um, Atlanta Rotary President Alec Frazier learned that the speaker for that day had canceled, leaving a void in the schedule. I was scheduled to speak the following week, but at 7 in the morning, I got a call from Joe Goodwin saying, we need a speaker today, Jay. Can you do it? And even though I had an early afternoon plane flight out of town, we worked it out. Uh, the rotary ship was back sailing straight ahead, and President Alec was happy. Uh, and I hesitate to remind you what I said at the time, because as the world's best Rotary Club, uh, you obviously have perfect memory of everything that I said back then. But there are a few new members, so I will simply say that I was presenting the argument of my book that said it was important for a nation like ours that was importing 60% uh, of its oil, net import 60%, to deal with that problem for reasons of national security, uh, for reasons of our economy, for the environment. Uh, for starters, a lot of the oil money ends up in countries that are financing terrorist groups. So uh, I, I made that argument. But uh, truth uh, be known, there was a lot of pushback against that from energy experts. Uh, and um, their argument was that, well, why should you interfere with free trade? You know, we don't complain because uh, we're importing too many running shoes from um, China, so why should we complain that we're importing too much oil? And uh, I, most of the reviews, I have to say, were favorable, but I, I, my favorite was, I, I guess, a little on the negative side from a think tank in Washington that you have probably all heard of, but I will not um, uh, identify. Uh, they said of my book, and I quote, Extensive economic analysis amply supported by historical experience indicates energy independence is a stupid idea. <laughs> the benefits are non-existent, the cost huge. Jay Hakes has the dubious distinction of preparing by far the best research effort in this realm and reaching some of the worst conclusions. Now, you have to have a thick skin in this business. So I, I actually regard that as a positive review because it said that I had some of the worst ideas, leaving open the possibility that there were others who had even worse ideas. But I had done the best research. So, so that, you know, you have to look for the silver lining. I'd like to go back and talk with them about that today. Uh, here we are six weeks later, and we have um, uh, experienced something that by any definition of the word revolutionary has been a revolutionary period in American energy. Our imports peaked um, in 2005 and 2006 at six, uh, 60 percent, as I said. That's a net number, so if you hear another number, they're divining it some other way. And back in those days, it was projecting, most pro uh, people were saying we're going to go up to about 70 percent, and it seemed to be unstoppable. So. Guess what it was in 2013? 33%. That is a big change. And in the last few weeks, we've gotten the numbers for uh, 2014, 27%. So you get a, a number that had been going up steadily since World War II. Everybody's saying it's going to keep going up, or almost everybody. And I, I mean almost everybody, uh, you know. Um, and now it's down to 27. And, and the momentum is there to keep that number going low. Now, the most visible reason for this is what's called the fracking boom. And uh, I, I, I can give a whole talk on fracking, but uh, let me just say what it is. I mean, technically, it's hydrological fracturing, which means that you're putting water down a pipe at very high pressure to break up the rock that surrounds the oil that you're trying to get to. If that was the only thing that we really meant by fracking, it would not be enough because we also need to have the horizontal drilling because the horizontal drills allow you to go down and then sideways, which reduces the footprint on the surface, but you're also hitting the rock at a better angle. And also, we have much better seismology today, so we're not drilling as many dry holes, and uh, it's, it's quite a wonderful um, technological advance. Since 2007, production in this country of oil is up 74%. Now, to put that in perspective, I, I didn't bring any PowerPoints with me, but you can picture this in your mind. 
Colonel Drake finds oil in 1859. It's, it's going up and up and up production until 1970. And then 1970, it peaks and it comes down, 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 down to 2007. And then since 2007, it's up 74%. Now, in my book, that's revolutionary. Yeah, we see prices jump around and commodity prices jump around a lot, but big trends like imports and production don't jump around like that. Um, now, I would also say that this 74% increase occurred at a time where we had some problems in offshore drilling, um, namely the BP oil spill, which slowed down drilling in the Gulf for several years. The Gulf is coming back strong now. Uh, per, uh, leases are being sold, a lot of exploration activity, a lot of success finding new uh, supplies. So that hasn't even been doing what was expected, and still we went up 74%. During the same period um, in uh, uh, domestic renewable energy, in just three years, we've seen wind power production in this country go up 45%. In the last three years, photovoltaic solar has tripled. Um, also because of, um, uh, to get away from renewables, also because of fracking, you've seen the explosion of natural gas production. And so Georgia Power, for instance, probably more aggressively than, than anybody in the country, has been shutting down the older coal plants, replacing it with natural gas, which uh, burns much cleaner. Now, it's not all a demand side issue. It, or it's not all a supply side issue, because the demand side makes a difference. And we have in place rather stringent automobile regulations that go up to uh, 2025. Uh, mandate that uh, vehicles average, new vehicles at that date average 55 miles per gallon. Now there's a lot of loopholes in that law, so we'll say maybe that's actually 50, but um, uh, that, that is strong momentum on the demand side for, for this. And also there's walkability. You know, I, uh, our kids have watched us commute and they didn't think that was a very good idea. Um, I think I've heard Doug Hooker and A.J. Robinson maybe refer to this in some of their comments, that they've noticed a trend that young people don't feel like they have to have cars quite the way uh, the previous generations did. And that is actually showing up now in the national data. I didn't realize how national this was till I got up to a conference in Washington recently. And it's amazing. The kids are walking more, they're sharing rides, they want to be close to mass transit, and that is uh, affecting the demand side. U.S. oil uh, usage peaked in 2005. We'll never reach that um, level again. Uh, we'll watch and see how fast it goes down. The lesson of all this is that things can change rapidly. Um, and uh, it sometimes catches a little by surprise. And it happens not necessarily because there's a silver bullet but because there's a lot of silver buckshot. I mean, I've just sort of scratched the surface of factors that are involved here. And I think the fact is that when someone has proven to you there's no silver bullet, the next conversation should not be uh, about how we're gonna give up, it's about how we find the silver buckshot. Now, the topic for today is, is this kind of revolution a model for dealing with what are some pretty substantial sustainability issues that confront us? And what I thought I would do, partly because I'm ending my uh, very happy four years, 14 years here at Atlanta Rotary Club, uh, and I really have appreciated the stimulation, stimulating conversations and uh, being with you, but I want to look at what's happening in Atlanta that gives us hope that perhaps uh, if a uh, revolution is not already occurring, the seeds have been planted. So, Let's talk a little bit, for instance, about buildings in Atlanta. Um, just a few weeks ago, the New York Times uh, had an article about Agnes Scott College and its president, Elizabeth Kish, uh, who's one of our members, of course. Uh, and they have a, a, an energy efficiency program where they've invested uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're getting paybacks for 3.7 years. So this has had appeal to everybody, even people who did not uh, particularly care, care about the environment because it was good economics. So this was a good example uh, for, for everyone that this could be achieved and it was also nice to see this national recognition for one of our local institutions. But it's far from confined to Agnes Scott. 
uh, you, you read the paper all the time and Emory's putting up another um, uh, uh, lead building. Uh, I don't use acronyms enough, so that's Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, very prestigious award. Uh, and Georgia Tech is putting them up all the time. So, and I'm sure the other schools are too. So, and the law firms now and, and the private companies, uh, lead certified is an important um, endorsement. And, and Atlanta now has become a, a leading lead city around the country. And to have buildings like this, it takes good architects, and we have architects in our club. Uh, Perkins and Will is a, is a great firm. I uh, saw so Will Laracy out there and, and Phil Harrison. Uh, they, they design really great buildings. Sometime you ought to, if you haven't already, visit the Museum of Design Atlanta. And if you can get the energy tour, they'll show you all the little, the, the, the really deep thinking that went into the design. You know, in a public building, uh, there's a much different energy profile depending on how many people are in the building because if there are a lot of people in there, they give off heat. And so that, that building has a dual design and they can switch back and forth to make sure they're using the most energy efficient uh, configuration. And um, so that is a big part of the building future. And uh, there are a lot of other architects who I'm not... Um, um, uh, I don't have time to mention. I'll just mention Bill Clark because I get to sit by him sometimes and uh, we, we have a lot of fun talking about energy. You cannot talk about buildings in Atlanta or in Georgia uh, without talking about South Face, one of the country's great leaders in uh, energy efficient buildings and its uh, um, leader, Dennis Creech, uh, one of our members. Uh, a graduate of Emory, I think. Uh, and, uh, you know, Dennis is a little bit like former Mayor Shirley Franklin. We, she wanted us to remember her uh, because she was the, the, the mayor that fixed the sewers. And uh, I think Dennis wants to remember, be remembered as the guy that got us all to clean our air conditioning ducts. Um, you know, if, you, you go up to Dennis and say, how can I save a, a lot of money in my home? And, well, you know, actually, Having clogged ducts costs you a lot of energy. So, uh, uh, but it's more than that. They have studied energy efficient housing at a very high level. They adapt it to our particular climate and they work very well with the home building community uh, to develop um, uh, earthcraft homes, which you've probably heard of. And if you want to buy one, uh, you probably don't have to go too far. John Whelan or Bruce Gunter would probably sell you an Earthcraft home. Others as well, probably. Um, such projects reduce energy costs, enhance customer appeal, and promote sustainability. These buildings, many of them, need carpets. A lot of carpets are made in Georgia. And the, the, the legendary great leader in the carpet industry, uh, the late Ray Anderson, a graduate of Georgia Tech, uh, had an epiphany in 1994. And he did not want the profits of Interface Carpets, his company, to be stealing from the sustainable environment that would be handed off to his grandchildren. And that meant doing business in a slightly different way. So the emphasis became on recycling. You get all the old carpets you can, so you're not starting from scratch. You use modular design. They use these, I'm quite familiar with them because they, they were adopted at the Carter Presidential Library a few years ago. And I got an opportunity to show them to Ray Anderson when his book came out. Uh, so so you, um, if you damage them, which they, I don't think you can damage them, but if you actually did, you just have to replace that little module, not the whole carpet. Uh, they um, do use a lot of renewable in, um, energy and they use the concept of biomimicry. Now that sounds like a complicated term, but it's where you're copying uh, uh, nature. And they actually at Interface would send people out to the forest to see what made it beautiful. And not every leaf is, leaf is exactly the same. Uh, it's the diversity that creates the beauty. And the same thing can be true about a carpet that, that has modules. They don't have to all be the same. And so if you, uh, one comes out a little different, you don't have to throw it away. Uh, a great principle that can be applied. Uh, even though Ray's no longer with us, uh, uh, Interface has a goal of mission uh, zero by the year uh, 2020 to reduce their uh, uh, environmental uh, footprint. And, and I might say Mohawk and other uh, companies are following suit. And I might point out that Interface is very profitable. 
Restaurants who, who uh, William mentioned in, in his report, uh, I, I, uh, he says they're very good, and, and I try to go out on a regular basis and test that proposition. Uh, they are very good. <laughs> and a lot of them are leaders in sustainability. You know, a restaurant can take their waste uh, grease and they, it can be made into biofuel, uh, biodiesel actually, which is even more valuable than biogasoline. Um, and they can use the whole product. They use the whole hog or they use the uh, strawberry greens or the carrot tops. Um, a couple of months ago, I was eating at Empire State South and I saw in the menu that uh, the um, uh, salad included watermelon rind. And I was giving a speech in a couple of weeks at a national food and beverage uh, uh, conference about, about energy, and I said, I better go eat that. Uh, so I got it, and it was very nice marinated uh, watermelon wine. They didn't throw it away, tasted great, and I mentioned that in my speech as, as another example of how the restaurants were adopting some very good principles uh, that were helping us get where we need to be. Uh, there are a lot of things to pay attention to. Uh, switching to LED uh, bulbs is important. A lot of that's going on around town. Just in the office, having the copy machine default to two-sided copy uh, recycling, this is all part of the silver buckshot. Now let's move to transportation, a timely topic in our fair state. And uh, I would, because I live in Midtown, I'll start in Midtown. Uh, where the Midtown Alliance has done a great job of making sure we have very wide sidewalks, that we have mixed-use uh, development, and create a very walk walkable environment. Uh, the Alliance CEO is one of our members, Kevin Green. And plus, one of the great uh, members of Midtown Alliance is, is a very prestigious organization called the Federal Reserve Board. And uh, both uh, during the Jack Gwynn era and the Dennis Lockhart era, uh, the board has provided a lot of leadership for uh, Midtown Alliance, and I'd like to thank them for all they've done. Another one of our members, Catherine Kelly, has been very active uh, in, in uh, building uh, uh, walkable communities. As you noticed last week in a report by Maria Saporta, um, that um, she's working on uh, Manny's uh, and, and making it part of, of a walkable community. Now, that's a little bit like amending a church in a way, for those of us who eat at Manny's a lot. Uh, and, uh, but when you stop and think about it, this trolley, next extension, go beyond the King Historic site, out to the Carter Center, out near Manny's, uh, Beltline crosses out around there. So there's all sorts of interesting things that are gonna be happening over a certain time period where you might be able to get out to Manny's and you might not need a car quite like you used to. Uh, the uh, Georgia State University, uh, under the leadership of Carl Patton and Mark Becker, who's with us today, uh, that certainly uh, contributed to a, a, a downtown walking uh, phenomenon. Now, uh, electric vehicles. Um, electric vehicles don't solve all of our problems, but in my judgment, having looked at the major studies, I, I think they put us uh, ahead uh, in a lot of respects and in a, a, a direction that we should follow. And what has happened is that Georgia, and Atlanta in particular, are the center of the action right now. Nissan built its plant that produces the Nissan LEAF right across the border in Tennessee. There is a federal tax credit of $7,500. Georgia has a tax credit of $5,000. That's a fairly substantial financials incentive. The Department of Energy notices that, uh, that this is going on and starts subsidizing the building of charging stations even before this is coming. It's kind of prior planning. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency writes rules that are uh, very favorable for electric vehicles. Georgia Power, uh, which has long been a fan of electric cars, even back in the late 90s, and again with this probably more substantial uh, penetration of cars into the market, and has put in place a, a very aggressive time of day pricing program. Now with an electric car, it takes a while to charge. So you wanna do it while you're asleep and society, the broader society would like you to do it at night as well because that's when there's less demand on the electrical system. You don't have to build new plants to power them. So to incentivize that, Georgia Power has put in place these, um, this time of day pri pricing option. So here you have all the different groups uh, somehow 
seemed almost to coordinate, because does that ever happen? Yes, it does occasionally happen. And, and, and so now, each month you read the data, and it's uh, either Atlanta's number one in the nation, or we're number one in the nation outside of California. Now, what if you want to go to zero, from zero to 60 in five seconds or less? And you want, to, and you want Prius like mileage, and you're willing to pay for it. Well, you could get a Tesla, or you could get the plug in Porsche Panamera. And um, those are coming through Porsche North America, located in our region, Joel Foltz, uh, General Counsel. And if you wanted to buy one, we have a member who, if you really twisted his arm, you, I don't know if any of you heard of Steve Hennessy, he, he might sell you one of those cars. So they are available. Solar energy. We uh, were not leaders in solar energy in Georgia a few years ago. We did have scientists at Georgia Tech. I've been in their labs. Um, they wake up in the morning. They go to work. They have two goals. One is to increase the efficiency of solar cells so you don't have to have as big an array on the roof, and two, bring down the cost. And they chip away at it day after day after day. But for a while, we weren't actually seen that many bought and coming into the market. Uh, thank God for the Turner family. Uh, they were for solar before it was cool. Now it's cool. Uh, and we were, our Public Service Commission now has become big backers of solar. We have the Georgia Green Tea Party, big backers of solar. And Georgia Power is buying a lot of solar. So uh, it's all coming, that's starting to come together, starting from a small base, but moving very rapidly. Uh, the, the legislature is currently uh, uh, considering legislation uh, that will make it easier for churches, nonprofits, and individuals to uh, lease or buy solar. Uh, John Sibley of our club has been doing a lot of good work helping educate members about that. Now, I have hesitated to take the approach that I uh, just took of citing all these good things going on because I left out a lot of things. and. Um, you know, how could you leave out the late Milt Bevington, who's not with us anymore, but a great energy guru who I used to love to talk to. And, and then we have the very much alive Jim Stokes at uh, Sustainable Solutions. And, and, and many in this room are involved in this, but uh, there's not enough time. I also was hesitant to take this approach because it might suggest that everything that needs to be done is already being done. And I, I wish I could say that, but it's, it's not really true. Uh, if you look at this, uh, the principle, if a lot of people that live along the river reduce the amount of trash they throw in the river, you still have to get the rest of the people to quit throwing their trash in the river. Um, and it's kind of the same way with the air and the atmosphere. The fact that there's some good voluntary efforts going on, uh, uh, you, you still have to have a broader program to do what needs to be done. And we, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's going to probably bring us to the need for something like carbon pricing or, or stricter limits. But the point I'm trying to make today, and I'm about to move to the question period, is that does this per period where we've kind of gotten to energy independence or pretty close to it, we don't have to go down to zero imports. So we have so much more leverage now in the international community than we had before. Uh, we've our negative energy balance of payments was running about a billion dollars a day. That's gone way, way down. So that, does that successful model say that that same kind of revolution could happen in sustainability. And I, the, 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 the narrow argument I'm trying to make today is that we could do this without wrecking the economy or other values that are also important. Uh, interface carpets is not losing money. Uh, and uh, so we, we need to develop a positive attitude and say, hey, we can do that. And I'd like to just say a lot of people out there, many of them in this room are already working on it, and we should be glad that they are. So at this point, I'd be glad to transition to questions, or if anyone that wants to get up and brag about uh, the many things I left out, yeah. Yes, uh, the major studies on fracking uh, that I'm aware of that have been done by uh, people without an axe to grind 
have been done in uh, Oklahoma and Ohio and produce somewhat different results. But yes, if the water is not re-injected properly or if you're drilling too close to a fault, uh, uh, fracking can lead to seismic activity, usually very small, almost you know, very low on the Richter scale. Um, those both can be corrected by having proper uh, reinjection policies and better involvement of the geological community in the selection of sites. So it is an issue, but it doesn't kill the deal. It just it just says that each state, you know, a state like Texas, they don't have these kinds of problems because they're used to regulating oil and gas. You get in some other states, you know, uh, it's it's sort of unusual for Ohio to have, you know, all this natural gas production. So it takes them a couple of years to to get it down, uh, working. Yeah, okay. Do you feel that any danger that cheap gas prices and independent Indians might ignite the big car manufacturing that the people are already talking about bringing big gas and cars might be dangerous? Yeah, the, the low prices certainly could lead to some uh, 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 customer uh, response that would look less for the energy efficient car and more for the old fashioned big car. There is sort of a safety valve there because we do have a federal law that requires a certain uh, average for, for new car efficiency. And so I think that that will, uh, will serve as a buffer against that. Uh, some might argue, and, and I would argue, I mean, I argued this in my book, so it's no secret. Uh, it may not be that popular to say it, but I, I, I think at some point you need a gasoline tax. I mean, we haven't raised the gasoline tax since 1993. Inflation has, has Eaten, eaten away at, at, at that. So, you, you know, there are other ways to compensate for that. But that, that's something that we'll have to keep an eye on. Yeah, Jim. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, my view on the Keystone Pipeline is the arguments have been exaggerated on both sides. I think the environmentalists started it by saying this was the tipping point for climate change. It's nowhere near as important as the EPA regs or a number of other things that are going on. Uh, and I think under current law, it's, it's very hard to stop it because we import bitumen from Venezuela, which was basically the same things as tar sands oil from, from Canada. So I don't see how, if it went to the courts, which it undoubtedly would, how uh, stopping it would, would, um, would stand up. Now, um, the, the, the argument for it has been exaggerated as well, uh, you know, um, and they couldn't import it to China through um, the, the West because they couldn't get the permits in Canada to build a pipeline. So it's, it's been exaggerated on both sides uh, and, and I think distracted from some other issues that are really a, a big issue. I, I do say, you know, tar sands coming on, they're more energy intensive. Uh, it, it does make the climate change issue more difficult, but I, I, I'd rather approach it on the demand side than, than shut off supplies from North America because it, it kind of looks like you're not sensitive to national security concerns. And so part of energy policy is trying to be sensitive to economic, national security, and environmental concerns. And, and I, what I argue in my book is I want the three first, the things that work in all three areas. And sometimes they come into conflict a little bit and then you have to balance things off a little bit. Yes. Well, I would have said the auto efficiency standards because that's been, um, you know, the, the major theme of my book, but that sort of has been done. So, uh, and, and actually we're not building any new coal plants, which would have been my next, um, next issue. So, uh, I, at this point, I don't know. I, I would like to, ha what I would like to have is a low cost option for nuclear or carbon sequestration. Uh, both of those are out, see both wind and solar are intermittent power, so you'd like to have a non-intermittent source that was non-carbon. So having carbon capture and solar and nuclear, but you know, at this stage, we haven't gotten the prices down where they're gonna be fully successful. But, but I, I guess uh, if we could do that, and I think we could if we built enough of the plants because you, you improve a technology by using it. And, and anytime you're starting up again, or, or doing it for the first time, or you haven't done it for a long time, it's going to run a little bit more money. Thank okay. you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.